Hey everyone, well, welcome to another AI conversation. I'm uh, I'm doing this in my car. <laughs> uh, I think the first time I'm going to do it, but uh, I I'm really excited with today's guest. I'm joined today by Sasha Kolpakov. Uh, I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, he's uh, he's a chief scientist, formerly a professor. So welcome to the show, Sasha. Thank you, Dominic. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, I hope you're not driving your car at the moment. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't think we're self-driving just so, yet. <laughs> yeah, but, it's safe. Yeah, it's but safe for, because for the, I was, for the people I was who about are... to say, to say something about Yeah, yeah. No, I was going to say for the people, I mean, I'm sure you're quite famous, but for the few people who don't know you, maybe just give us a brief uh, background of yourself and then let's just get into the conversation. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Sasha Kolpakov. Um, uh, by training, I'm a mathematician, and um, as Dominic remarked, I'm a former professor. Um, I held several postdoctoral uh, positions in the United States and Canada, including Vanderbilt University and the University of Toronto. Um, and now I'm a chief scientist of uh, Cerebris um, AutoML platform, which yeah. is a startup in Florida. Yeah, I'm that curious, aims to I'm curious about your I'm curious about your startup. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a bit. But I have a question. So you mentioned University of Toronto. So did you yeah. run into uh the godfathers of AI? Because I know a number of them are based there, right? Bengio and and Hinton. Weren't they part of that faculty? Or did you, did you run um Hinton is in Toronto? Yeah. And I think Bengio is in Montreal. Montreal, all right. Um well I <laughs> I used I used to spend quite a lot of time in both cities um, because of their culture um, and other other things. But uh, because I was a mathematician, I didn't run into those people personally. So I had a chance, but I didn't. So is it where where did um, they know, where which department were they part of? Like computer science? I, I'm surprised that as a mathematician, you never ran into. <laughs> No, the, the math department in Toronto is separate okay. from from the computer science department. Um, what separates them is, um, I think, just one floor by the elevator. But <laughs> I guess everyone keeps people, to themselves. <laughs> people, people from one department do not go to the other department that uh, that much. I'm afraid. Okay. okay. Um, which which shows a lot of disconnect actually between computer science. And uh, what people call pure mathematics, um, and this was actually one of my main motivators to uh, to to start to to turn my career around and uh, start doing science for uh, for startups. Yeah, can you talk talk about your startup a little bit? Uh, what's the what's your background there, and what 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 kind of work are you doing? So. Let's um let's first describe what, what Cerebrus wants to do. So what Cerebrus aims at is uh, democratizing machine learning and artificial intelligence um, in a way that uh, those features will become available for small or medium-sized businesses. Um, that is, we want artificial intelligence to be accessible for people who may use it, who need to use it, um, who want to give it a try, who have already an idea what they want to do with um, artificial intelligence. So maybe they, they just want to forecast their sales or um, churn, or maybe they, they, they want some custom model um, working for them. Um, so we are open to both um, ways. So one is kind of standardized way and um, quite a bit of work has already been done um, for the AutoML platform where people can upload their data and get back a working model that is tailored to, to their data, tailored to their, to their use case. And uh, they, can, they can deploy this model later on either on our hardware or what we provision for them, or they can just uh, download the model and use it uh, uh, for themselves. So on their own. 
um, we we don't actually uh, we don't actually log them out of of their model. Um, and another thing is, of course, uh, if if people want something uh, uh, that is less standard, let's say, or something that uh, our AutoML platform cannot do yet, uh, of course, we come to the rescue and uh, we consult and custom develop such a model. So basically, um, our motto is bring us your data. We give you a model that is small, robust, fit for purpose, and highly optimized. Um, that's first. Well, um, second, what do we what do we actually do? Um, so the idea is um, that most machine learning models um, pretty much retain a linear structure. It could be a multi-layer perceptron. It could be a convolutional network. Uh, still, you see, you know, layers by layers of stacks of filters, stacks of dense layers um, that allow information to flow in one direction. So the structure is more or less linear, even if you have, uh, you know, all, all those special things like uh, uh, they they do shortcuts sometimes in in convolutional networks, so that you you don't you, you avoid bottlenecks. And uh, there are, there are a lot of there are a lot of things that people do for better training for better performance, but a general structure, nevertheless, is more or less linear. Um, our idea is that this structure can be and has to be modified. And um, the main motivation is that um, apparently human brain doesn't have this linear structure. It, can, it, it has a structure of neurons that kind of spread out and they are interconnected. And uh, there are also a lot of lateral connections on all levels. Of course, we do not claim we understand how human brain works, uh, but it's our inspiration. And um, um, mathematically speaking, the idea is that the model structure, the model architecture um, can be roughly constructed as um, dense layers. So neurons, basically, uh, sitting at the nodes of a graph where neurons are connected by edges. There are links between neurons transmitting information. Um, and the structure of this graph has to be close to the so-called small world graph structure. Um, small world graphs are known not only in mathematics, uh, they are also known in biology. Uh, because apparently these are the mathematical structures that describe synchronization um, of, of grasshopper chirping. So that's I, I think this was basically the the the, um, the ground laying work by Watson Strogatz um, when they when they developed a mathematical model of insect singing or chirping synchronization uh, because for them um, it was a curious phenomenon that insects somewhere in the field synchronize their frequencies very well even though it, it was known that uh, one insect can only hear its neighbors it doesn't really hear insects that that are chirping somewhere far away um, and still they're synchronized so this is the idea. And it's open source. So it's hidden in place, plain sight. Everyone can go on GitHub and download the base model for Cerebrus and use it. Um, so the, the commercial part of it is oriented uh, towards people who do not probably have time or they they are not so versed in all those granular details of, of how of how our model or ml ai in general work 
um, but they want to use it and and they can profit from it. Um, so we we do not want to to let this uh, this knowledge and power concentrate, basically. Uh, I, I think this is the only way to progress. Uh, because there are a lot of um, people, um, small owner, medium size owner, medium size business owners, um, who cannot afford hiring uh, a AI ML engineers, or cannot cannot afford hiring you know a chief scientist. Um, they cannot afford developing such things themselves, uh, but they would profit from having their own model that is also secure that is you know that that doesn't belong to someone who can leverage just the ownership of this model um i think this is this is fear this is this is this is how it has to be done as otherwise you know i'm i'm a pretty capitalist guy <laughs> as you may notice from what i'm doing um, but there is there is um, a bit of difference between uh, you know capitalism and, and free market and uh, techno feudalism. <laughs> yeah, there's a yeah. term that's called uh, regulatory capture. I think it's kind of the big the big play that some of the big AI companies are trying to do to stop competition but no no i don't want to talk about that <laughs> but i want i don't want to come back oh no no well i mean i i understand i i can i can see it yeah. um and uh this is this is this is of course not good um i'm kind of i'm kind of curious what happens now in in europe um because <laughs> Well, the, the regulation. If you if you read um if if you read something on, on the internet, like the, the main takeaways from from the re regulation recently ad adopted, um, well, they you know they they try to avoid uh, like bad use cases, of course, discrimination, uh, uh, mass surveillance, uh, all, all this. So it looks like they adopted all measures against that kind of let's say bad thing happening um but uh, i still have to dive into the exact language and and see what's written there um because so far a few things said uh, in the press um, seem a bit vague to me so for example it is said that there is a ban on on emotional recognition or some similar technologies, um, which seems, of course, reasonable if um, if you do it for the purpose of legal proceedings, right? You you don't want your model to say, "Oh, this this person is lying under the oath by mistake," because that 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 will have very bad consequences. Of course, miscarriage of justice. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, maybe diagnosing certain conditions, medical conditions, uh, can be helped by such a system. After all, measuring someone's emotional response, uh, especially if, if this person really cannot express themselves, right, because of their condition or because of their age. Uh, maybe some early early stage uh, autism detection, at least something like pre-screening uh, could be helpful. In fact, uh, when when you do all those tests, all those pre-screening tests that that they, they are used to do on small humans, right? Uh, you only you only have um, the chance of catching it early if if, if you do it. Um, so, and and you actually ex expect you expect a lot of false positives, which is absolutely fine in screening tests. So, like screening tests for rare diseases, 
they're all fine. It's it's better to catch it earlier rather than later. Uh, but you expect a lot of false positives. They don't hurt in this setting. In other settings, of course, false, false positive can literally kill someone. Um, but banning this technology outright is, I believe, not uh, not an answer. And also, if you look, um, it's what's said in the press. I'm, I'm not claiming I read this legislation. Well, it's it's, it's huge. <laughs> it's of course huge. Uh, it's hard to read for for a single person. But uh, if you look at the amount of fines, some are pretty draconian. They also say that they will cut some slack for startups, but um, who would who would want to start a startup uh, that in, does in something, such an you know, something right? sensitive if they can be fined up to literally tens of millions? <laughs> that's that's too much risk. So, so wait, I have, I have a question. Since uh, you obviously run a startup and you're obviously supportive of the kind of the kind of the the machine learning ecosystem community wide um if we jump back slightly to your the concept of uh your your democratization of modeling can you maybe describe a little bit about what was what was the main inspiration like for example auto ml is about getting machine learning done with not too much code right so is that the similar motivation for you or were there other things? Um, well, it's an interesting question because, um, you know, there is um, a David Thrower, who is the um, CEO, and it was initially his idea. And then I came in as, as chief scientist. But for me, of course, for me, as a mathematician and as a scientist, um, the main motivation was that uh, the mathematical problem is very interesting so i can you know i like solving problems and this this problem was mathematically challenging and um, um it was also meaningful so solving this problem would definitely help people uh, and democratize artificial intelligence and uh, um, have some impact on the world because a lot of a lot of research problems, um, whether they are purely mathematical or even in more applied areas, <laughs> uh, they lack exactly this uh, very substantial component. Uh, you solve a very complicated problem, and then the question is, well, who cares? Okay, one person did. Well, maybe maybe several people who worked on it, but who else? So my my main motivation was to 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 generate some positive impact, um, and I think democratization of AI is uh, already good enough for this. Um, of of course, uh, I don't know what uh, what David's main motivation was. It's I'm not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm not here to speak on his behalf. No, let's say no problem, no problem. Earlier, you mentioned that you know a lot of the machine learning has a very linear structure, and I kind I kind of think that's that's kind of a bias that we inherited from from statistics, right? So, and then now you 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 I think you basically described one of the more recent developments, which is uh, graph graph neural networks, or I don't know if I got that correct, which is not necessarily linear. So maybe could you talk a little bit about that? What are kinds of problems, apart from the crickets, <laughs> that uh, that don't lend themselves too much on a linear, from a linear standpoint? And, and I guess you're trying to commercialize it. So I can imagine you're pitching to a CEO or some uh, companies. What would be the, the add-on for them? To explore these kind of alternative modeling, is that, is that something you can discuss? One of the main was well, the main advantages of this approach that we have um, 
Yeah, and you can you can call it, uh, of course, um, graph neural networks. In, in a way, they they are. Um, yet they're a little bit um, different. I mean, the general structure is modeled uh, on a graph, yes, but uh, also some some sort of a special graph structure. Um, okay, so let's say they are specialized graph neural networks. Um, but the main advantage is that uh, they are able to learn from a very small amount of data. Exactly the thing is here, um, as opposed to in principle, uh, some fixed structure, be it a linear structure or a graph structure that you start with, um, here, the architecture is also modified in the search process. So the optimization process considers several architectures. And those architectures are fine-tuned. So the graph is always changing um, while we optimize the model. And also the number of neurons is changing and so on. So it's, um, it's a pretty huge uh, Bayesian optimization problem. Um, that works both on the level of models, architecture, um, and um, uh, on the level of uh, um, of its hyperparameters and so on. So it's a uh, it's a bit a little bit more than just taking um, um, an already existing structure and trying to fine tune the hyperparameters. So the structure is also changing. It's a, um, it's a process that uh, basically aims to capture as much of your data set's complexity as possible without, of course, overfitting. And um, we, we, we did several use cases. Um, we did several tests. So for example, it is able to predict uh, housing prices after learning on just about 10% of the whole data set. So it's it's not the standard 80-20 split. It's more like you can train it on 20% of your data set and it will perform really well on the remaining 80. And um, it is also pretty affordable. I mean, it doesn't doesn't require a lot of computing, a lot of compute to run. So people who want to use it can use it uh, pretty much uh, easily. And with our platform, the only thing that is required is your data. So you you literally go to Cerebra's OTML platform, upload your data, and you have a model. You don't need to write a single line of code. Sorry, I was on mute. So in terms of um, what are some common use cases that you have encountered or looking to, to tackle? Because for example, I know that like in standard statistical modeling, a popular customer is like marketing departments, right? some customer yes. organization or maybe risk management maybe they did some fraud detection or credit scoring so in your case uh for this particular approach do you see some common use cases of people coming up um yes we we have already customers um regretfully i cannot uh, really tell you exactly what the customers are and what their needs are um but i can tell that we can handle all kinds of table or, table or data. So whatever you want, uh, you want to predict sales, you want to predict churn, uh, you want to score your customers in such some way. Uh, yes, that is doable. Yeah. Okay. So which, whichever whichever kind of table or data you have, it it can be processed automatically yeah. at this moment. Um, well, of course, the only thing is, um, 
we also have um, some sort of um, principles. <laughs> um, so there, there is a the, the product itself, uh, either its commercial part or its um, open source part, comes with a license. And um, in this li this license is an extended Apache license uh, that uh, prohibits certain use cases. So we we pretty much understand that this model is versatile. It can be used for uh, good things, but um, we 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 prohibit its use that will be discriminative or that will promote. Uh, you know, what will, will be used by business that, that sells unhealthy substances. Um, that is that is not what we want. So in respect uh, in respect uh, to your question, like yes, for, for you know, um, projecting sales or churn, predicting churn out of your table of data, that's uh, one of the of the most uh, most um, viable use cases. Um, the other thing is credit scoring. Uh, here, our concern is how fair it is. So we don't want to produce an unfair model. Sorry, I'm thinking about model fairness. Uh, and you mentioned, um, you know, all these regulatory stuff. This is going to be an interesting tangent. One, one, one concern. Obviously, I don't live in Europe, but if I use privacy as an example, well, what probably happens in Europe will be copy pasted everywhere else. And one problem that I see, at least amongst governments, it's my view, is there's. I think there's a general lack of understanding in in the regulatory front of how models actually work. And my worry is we're going to try to regulate it like the way we regulate normal like IT or deterministic systems without understanding kind of the nuances of how these models work. Do you have a perspective on that? Like what could go wrong? Like I'm worried about over-regulation is, is a problem. And then now, for example, you know, like the the approach you're advocating, this is not no. I would I wouldn't say it's it's a common commonplace, even in the academia. Not everyone uses graphs. Actually, funny enough, um, everyone's still stuck on the normal regression land and linear models. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I don't know what you what do you think? The, am I on? Am I onto something, or is this just me? <laughs> I'm just worried about it. Well, I mean, you you have all reasons to be worried about things, uh, especially things that are not um, entirely understood um, and that we have to deal with. Um, so, in 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 my opinion, of course, overregulating things is bad, but um, you cannot you cannot really turn it into a wild west thing, where it, where it, you know. People use models and just blame the computer. Like this uh, computer says no. Sketch, right? It, it's not good. Um, and we've seen already uh, lawsuits, um, say against uh, against insurances when people were denied coverage uh, or or benefits uh, because of a faulty AI system. So this is this is of course not what <laughs> Cerebrus or anybody um, anybody with a hint of decency wants to produce, um, but it happened. It, it already happened, and um, I think there are more cases like that we just don't know about um, because a lot of models um, are not open source; uh, they are privately used, and it's basically uh, it's a um, it's private business, right? It's trade secret. How how could those models be assessed or regulated, right? So, do, do you want police to come to a business and, <laughs> and, and investigate? Open, open up all those coefficients. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. So yes, right. Well, I mean, but the thing is, uh, if if something bad happens, um, there has to be some action, and uh, overregulation will definitely stifle progress. Uh, but there there has to be some regulation. Mm. What happens in Europe, I don't know. As I said, uh, a lot of things uh, that I read in the press are pretty vague. So certain certain things seem to be prohibited or not really allowed. Um, you know, uh, for example, in Europe, you cannot uh, you cannot access um, a lot of LLMs, a lot of um, not a lot of, well, you can download one and use it for yourself, but you cannot um, you cannot access uh, commercial ones. Uh, Chat GPT you can access, okay, um, but Google Board you cannot access. Um, Anthropic you cannot access. Well, not because they are banned, but because uh, Google and Anthropic just do not supply to you, to Europe, to most European countries. Um, and I, I think this is because of their regulatory concerns. Let's talk about the kind of the practitioner front. So I remember reading a number of your, I don't know if it was a reaction on LinkedIn or a post on LinkedIn about um, some common misconceptions about modeling. I think you wanted to talk about that. And then maybe link it to kind of the question earlier that the math departments and the computer science departments, oddly enough, don't talk to each other often. And that's actually the case here in the Philippines as well, right? So any any thoughts on that? Like how how ma how machine learning is being abused <laughs> accidentally by practitioners? Uh, this, is, this is not something I can assess actually. Um, Frank, Frank is speaking. I, I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> one of my concerns is uh, that it's not so much abused by the practitioners. Uh, it's more like uh, a lot, you know, people who develop it um, don't really educate the public. So it's it's not really the, the the intentional abuse that happens. Uh, it's mostly out of ignorance. People tend to believe those models as if they were some sort of oracles that uh, that always tell the truth. But it's not it's not uh, it's not the case. Uh, one thing that I'm concerned with. And that is somehow I, I didn't I didn't actually see um, so much about it in the regulatory discussion lately. Um, one thing I'm concerned about is um, AI fake detection or whatever they call them. AI content. So detectors. those AI detectors that detect AI produced texts or images. Yeah. Um, I, don't I have some work. problem with. I don't think they work. I don't. I, I don't think they work either. Yeah. And the thing is, I I strongly believe there are mathematical reasons why they cannot work. Yeah, sure. Um, and the the reason is is actually simple. Um, as we know, what a model does, ideally, it learns a statistically probabilistical distribution from a set of samples. So your data set is learned by the model, but what in fact happens mathematically is that this is a distribution of features that you want your model to learn. Uh, now, humans also produce uh, data yeah, that know. falls into some distribution, be right. it uh, uh, text or image, but this is the data we produce. So there is some human distribution here, and there is some machine distribution there, right? And the question is, um, how much do they uh, do they coincide? 
And of course, what machine machines do, they learn from a human distribution. And if they learn this distribution rather well, um, then once you have your detector and you test it, you will do the following. You will sample from the human distribution and from the machine distribution and ask your detector which sample belongs to which distribution. But if those two distributions are essentially identical, no detector will <laughs> ever tell you <laughs> with good probability uh, which is which. Uh, I mean, it's 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 just a mathematical fact. You you show your detector some samples, and they are sampled from essentially the same distribution. Um, so the only the only way, um, I mean, the only hope is that the human distribution of data is still somehow different from the machine distribution. Um, so the hope is basically that that machines learn badly. Yeah, so, I, 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 I sort of agree with that. <laughs> <this case. laughs> I mean, that's that's how deep fakes became a thing, right? They were able to basically essentially replicate what would be probabilistically real images. So it's very hard to very hard to detect. And another thing that I find, I don't know why people miss it. Maybe they don't. But you're trying to solve for the intent of the data using the data alone. <laughs> so for example, I intended to create a fake. Nothing in that data set is encoded with my intent to create a fake. You need another data set to kind of capture that kind of outside outside the, the, the main sample. For example, detecting fake news, right? Fake news is basically probabilistic text written with the intent to malign someone or you know attack someone, which could very well just be true uh, news as well, you know. Uh, so there's nothing intrinsically true or false by a word. You need another data point that kind of identifies that as, hey, look, that's malicious. But somehow people continue to, to do these models and attempt to classify fake, fake news without, without that kind of that extra vector or that extra identifier. So I think it's a lost cause unless you find a way of identifying intent, which is another data set, which someone must have tagged with whatever bias they have. I, I think it's a lost cause. I don't think it can, as you said, and you 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 approached it from a more mathematical standpoint. You're correct. If the the data that was reproduced statistically reproduces the distribution of authentic data, then there's really no way you can you can tell them apart. You need another vector embedded there that says, say, that's fake, it's true, and 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 if you have that, then you might as well just classify that vector and forget about the rest. So <laughs> yes, right, <laughs> right. So I don't get it. I don't get why people uh, insist. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I mean, one one thing is one thing is, of course, if you if you have someone in, invested in 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 you, tens of millions, <laughs> you don't want to go back and, and tell this guy, look, now I have a proof that your investment is lost. Yeah. yeah. Um, it it can it can generate uh, a very adverse reaction, I believe. Um, that's one thing. But um, what what I don't understand is, of course, there are some people who believe those models work and they use them, um, but they are practitioners. Um, how on earth someone who is an expert can can create such a model. Um why 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 don't it's a deceptive a approach if you think about it. It's a deceptive approach. <clears throat> in a way it could be. Um I, I don't want to blame any anyone personally. For, for but, um here I think um one one concern that I have, one one problem that I cannot crack is first of all, um why people who are experts in those systems try to create them. Um why they didn't have this pretty, pretty, pretty simple mathematical reasoning uh, that those models probably won't work, um, or they won't work reliably enough, uh, especially as uh, generative AI advances. Yeah. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, well, there, there are obvious um, ethical concerns. 
uh, even even such simple things as uh, some American teacher association yeah, signing a contract with a startup article. that yeah well I mean you know one can of course say these are just test scores but um, these are not just test scores right uh, this is this is a decision that uh, that affects uh, pupils that affects human lives. Um, this is a decision that affects basically uh, children, yeah. and uh, in the modern society, in the modern society, um, the society itself puts more trust in teachers, bringing up the new generation that it puts into parents. Yeah. It's just obvious because, because children spend more time at school than with their parents often. And I think most of the time, um, you know, we're going to need to. So well, there is no ethical spend, concern from teachers. We're going to need uh, to spend um, a lot of time on this, probably another episode, because I feel that. Yeah, that's uh, that's we're, that's we're, a we're kind headed, of, I mean, that's fantastic, but that strikes that yeah. strikes me very badly. Yeah, it, it, we're headed towards another apocalypse of its own. If we let these models, these faulty models become the basis for essentially tyranny hegemonic <laughs> moves but anyway yeah uh, let's bring it back to the science and uh and just like that we're nearly at the hour so it's interesting how we're having this conversation um as a startup and scientist in a startup can you give some advice for people who are mathematicians or data people because in my experience most of them tend to be not in a start in a startup they're like in employees at some corporations and stuff or they are in academia teaching so what was the come on for you to to join the startup world and, and what kind of advice would you give us mm. um what motivated me well um it's um it's always a hard personal question. Why? Why would you? What would want to approve your career and turn it around? Um, but for me, it was that. Um, well, what we call pure mathematics at the moment um, seems seems to me um, very sick. Um, the thing is, uh, a lot of uh, training is necessary to become a mathematician. Uh, but then for the rest of your career, uh, what you do, you work in a very narrow domain um, that is not impactful. I mean, you you, you write some very complicated uh, research paper and only 10 other experts in the world probably care about it. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not good. Uh, a lot, a lot of uh, mathematical researchers at the moment, uh, I, I believe they are just not capable of of using computers other than for writing emails. <laughs> um, and a lot of research can be done with a computer, also experimental research in mathematics. Um, of course, experimental proofs do not exist, but computer proofs exist, computer-assisted proofs exist. Um, and uh, experimentation with data is also possible in mathematics. In fact, mathematics is an experimental science. If you look at it the other way, it doesn't have to be theoretical. You can do experiments and uh, discover some laws. Later on, of course, you should and uh, you actually must prove them. Or you know, if if you want to establish a mathematical fact, you must give a proof. Um, but the question is, what the fact is? Um, is there anything interesting in this uh, data that you see in your research? Um, because proving a mathematical theorem about something non-interesting, I believe, is just a waste of time. So, um, but this is, this is not. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but this is not something that is widely accepted in the so-called pure mathematical community. Um, also, I believe, well, the 
um, uh, the the environment is um, rather toxic. Actually, this is this is what I found, um, and this this is provided. You know, I'm uh, not in any way marginalized or. Uh, yeah, I really, I really had a very, a very good mathematical career. <laughs> yeah, but very good you, academic. Degree. But you probably found the startup life, at least for now, far more interesting. Lots of other ideas. Yeah, it so. is. It is more interesting because people are more supportive. Um, there is a lot of hard work to do, and I think this is what motivates people to actually help each other. Um, of course, it, one can say, okay, okay, it's terrible life, um, because it's not like stable job. Um, Nobody knows what's going to happen. Uh, you have to invest long hours. It's it's very intensive. Um, and that is true. Uh, that can also hurt you if, you know, if you don't take some reasonable precautions. Um, but also the academic lifestyle hurts people. Um, always moving from one postdoc to the other. Uh, you have no social life. Um, That's true. I mean, starting a family, starting a family is, is a problem. It is. Um, there is there is some toxicity also that that is kind of uh, you know that is kind of boiling slowly, uh, mulling slowly inside a smaller group of people. Um, yeah, because there is there is no there is no reality check. And maybe the payoffs That's it. the payoffs are not commensurate with the toxicity. I mean it's always a risk and reward thing right i mean there's toxicity in startups too but oh least... yeah well i mean everywhere you have humans you have <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly you yeah. have good and bad um and uh yes but uh, one one of the things is um maybe just maybe uh when you're working for yourself you have more independence well said. Anyway, I'm sorry to cut it here. Obviously, we need to save some for the next chat. It's a lot. I mean, we barely scratched the surface. I want to take uh, the time to thank uh, Sasha for talking to us and hope to see you in another episode of AI Conversations. I mean, we, we love thank you, Dominic. Lots, of talk, lots to talk about. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sasha. Yeah, it was a lot of, lot of talking, but it was really great hour. Thank <laughs> you. Hope to see you again. Yeah, drive safe.